So my name's Georgie Hope and my business is called Large Hope. And that's actually in both of my parents' last names. So Hope is my dad's and Large is my mum's last name, which is kind of funny because she's like under five foot and absolutely tiny and <laughs> had to grow up with being called Large for a lot of her life. <laughs> um, but what I um, want my brand to actually represent is uh, disaster recovery. And that's both in the work that I'm actually doing for my clients right now and also for the people that I want to help in the future. And so um, that's why I know I have a lot of um, synergy there with cable. And um, so these are my kids, um, Autumn and Mittens, my cats, and Butterscotch and Phantom, my guinea pigs. And I live on the beautiful Sunshine Coast in Queensland. And my aim has always been to, to make a difference. And I think that's pretty much the same as everybody else that, um, you know, is in the, in the Connect Collaborative. Um, and I thought that the way that I was going to make a difference was by having loads of property that I could then sell and then use that money to generate an income to help people. And I really had kind of no idea why I was driven to do that or who I was actually even going to help. But in 2009, I had four property and I felt like I was kind of on my way to this um, dream. And then I lost my job and the universe had very different ideas. And I think it wanted to give me a lesson in understanding what it would actually feel like to be someone who really, really needed help. <laughs> and um, so in 2009, kind of over a three year period, I probably only earned about a third of what I'd been earning each year before that. Um, I went and got um, exemptions for my mortgage payments, but I had to end up selling three of the properties. Uh, my parents gave me $30,000, which was like a complete and utter lifesaver. And I rented out the fourth property and I went and house sat other people's homes who had animals and kind of moved every two weeks for about six months just so that I could um, try and keep that fourth property so that I could, for me, it just sort of felt like I was holding on to some kind of semblance of that, of that dream. Um, and then in um, 2011, those of us who live in southeast Queensland and Australia will remember the floods in, in Grantham. Um, and that's where like a, a dam broke and like a three metre wall of water just washed through this town. It was completely unexpected. And um, in, in this town, they had like that top left picture. I mean, these are houses that have just been moved hundreds of metres away and crashed into other buildings and people rescued off roofs. And that bridge had about 15 cars in it that they had to, to pull out from there. And at the time, I had this sort of the, the old garage at the back of my house that sort of had carpet on it that got a bit flooded. Um, and I checked in my insurance and it turned out that I was only covered for $15,000 for flood insurance. And it just made me think of all these people in Grantham and, and thinking about like, if my house had washed away like theirs did, I would have only got $15,000. And just how easy it can be to be kind of financially destroyed, maybe even when you think you were covered. And um, it kind of really made me sort of think about, you know, think about that <laughs> as being like a real problem. Um, and in Brisbane, we had, uh, you know, fl the floods as well. And so some houses flooded up to the roof or over the roof and up to the second level. And, and the council organised this thing called the Mud Army. And so they, they organised buses and I went out for, for two days on these buses. So basically, I just rocked up to a school and they organised you into groups and then put you on a bus and you kind of had no idea like where you were going to go or what you were going to see. Uh, but this is pretty much what it was like. And um, I didn't take any photos at the time because it didn't sort of feel right. But these were some photos I just got off of Google. And uh, the first day I helped this elderly couple whose house had been flooded up to the uh, second level. And I pretty much just spent most of the day like washing mud off the walls of the outside walls of their house. And it was like the mud was just so thick and just stuck there and like so hard to get off. It was amazing. And there was about 20 people like just at their house. Um, and inside they were doing like what these people in the top right are doing, just taking out all of the, the plasterboard because it's just basically all uh, ruined. 
Um, and this, this couple, it was really interesting because they'd actually been, in 1973, we had floods in Brisbane as well, and they'd been rescued from this same house at the second level by boat back in 1973. But the... Um, the government had then built this dam with the idea being that, you know, no flooding would ever happen again. But but that dam got so full that, of course, they had to release water. And so this couple knew what was coming and they had two days. And so they did actually get like a lot of the stuff out of their house with the help of friends and family beforehand. But so it was pretty much exactly like this for them. Um, and they had all these neighbours around them that had houses like this one next door. And they said they were trying to explain to them, like the people that live right next door to them um, weren't from Australia and English wasn't their first language. And they were trying to explain to them that like, you know, the water is going to come up and go right through your house. And and it's it was so hard to imagine because when you were there on the ground, like you couldn't see a river anywhere. You couldn't see water anywhere. It was so hard to imagine that, you know, that that's what it was going to be like. And on the second day, I got taken out to um, to a business that was a big shed with food machinery. And they'd managed to save some of their food by stacking it right up high on these shelves because it was kind of packaged nuts and grains and things. Um, but, and they'd saved their computers, but, but, you know, pretty much nothing else. And so... Um, there was no power and we were just basically there in the dark with torches, like washing, trying to wash out this machinery in the hope that they might be able to use it again. Um, and just sweeping mud, like I was, I've never been so sore as I was after sweeping mud. It, it's just like <laughs> amazingly hard work. Um, and, and look, it was great to be able to help them, but the thing I, I really wondered about is how these people were actually going to cope financially after this, you know. Uh, and I knew that one day I wanted to be able to do so much more um, because physically I knew that I wasn't going to be able to sweep mud for years to come. <laughs> and, um, and, and certainly back in 2011, I was still trying to financially rescue myself. So I, you know, I certainly didn't have any resources to kind of do anything in that way then. Um, and so my, my dream is, is still, I suppose, to have potentially millions of dollars or after the talk on Monday, I realised that maybe there's a lot of things that can be done even without any money. Um, but certainly what I would really like to be able to do is, is be on the ground, hearing people's stories, like phoning banks for them, getting mortgage payments suspended, paying phone bills, finding temporary accommodation, all that kind of thing that can make like just such a massive difference in that moment. because. Often when people are in some kind of a, you know, know, a disaster situation or even if, like me where I just lost my job, like emotionally you're kind of in shock and it can be really difficult to actually think logically and, and think about the things that could be done. I mean, for me, like I didn't, it took me months to know that I could suspend my mortgage payments. I had no idea that that was like even something that was possible. Um, and so, you know, certainly I didn't need to bleed as much money as, as I did because I didn't really care at that point in time if in five years in the future, my, you know, I was going to have, um, in, you know, that I'd have to be pushing that further forward because it was right then that I, I needed to be able to live. So... Uh, so yeah, so I don't really know exactly how this dream is going to happen, but I figured that if I just started putting it out into the universe, then who knows who um, might have, have ideas or um, people that I could connect to that would make this happen rather than it just being something that's kind of in the back of my mind going, oh, I'd really like that to happen one day. Um, and look, I, I buy tickets in the Endeavour Foundation Lottery and sometimes they have $10 million prize homes. So <laughs> who knows? Maybe the universe <laughs> will um, give me one of those so I can sell that and, you know, generate lots of income in order to be able to give because give people that kind of 10, 20, 30, whatever it is right then and there, more by paying their bills that, that might, you know, make a huge difference. But right now, coming back to the present, um, I've actually been running an SEO business for the last 10 years, so SEO search engine optimization. And I have um, staff that work for me, and I work about 20 hours a week in that. And I've been spending the rest of the time learning about book publishing and cryptocurrency to try and create um, other streams of income. And over the last six years, I have been able to... Uh, 
to give back money to various organizations and people. Um, but like I said, I, I still just really want to be able to do so much more. Um, but in my SEO business right now, the thing that I particularly want to focus on going forward is what I'm calling SEO disaster recovery. And, um, and how I would describe an SEO disaster is when you get a new website, the SEO isn't transferred across to the new website mm. and you lose a whole lot of traffic and then, you know, potentially end up going bankrupt. So preferably what I would like to do is protect businesses' website re traffic in a redevelopment so to actually prevent it from happening in the first place. Um, but a, a common statement that I hear people saying is that when you get your website redone, um, you'll lose some traffic, but it's okay because it will come back. And the truth is that you don't actually have to lose traffic at all. I mean, my current clients, they get their websites redone and I'm involved in the process and they don't lose any traffic. So it, it's not true that that has to happen. Um, and the other truth is that it doesn't always come back. So it's not magic. <laughs> you know, they, they have to have actually put something in the new site for it to come back. Um, and so I've, you know, I've seen sites where they've lost 80% of their traffic. And unless someone like me comes in, that's never coming back. So it's it's one of the things that I'm very passionate about trying to, to raise awareness about. And it's not something that affects everyone. In fact, it's probably only going to be a small percentage of people. Um, and that's why it's actually so difficult to raise awareness about it. Um, but someone here like Michael, who, you know, is supporting his family and staff through his business, who's told that he needs to get a new website or, or he feels like he wants a new website and, and to redo it. The, the aim, what he's actually looking for is to convert more traffic and, and to get more business. But he can't get more business if he loses half of his traffic. And so what he really wants is a website that's going to um, convert better but also actually uh, keep his traffic. And unfortunately, over the last 10 years, I've had to recover about one or two sites a year. Uh, in some cases, I've had to put staff off. They've been close to bankruptcy. And it just shouldn't happen because it just doesn't need to happen. Um, and that's why I'm trying to raise awareness about it. And, and initially, I kind of thought that maybe it was happening because of the fact that, um, you know, web developers just might not like they, they don't know what they don't know sometimes they're not seo experts so why would they and i wanted to sort of raise awareness with um with web developers but i got a client in november who when they got their website done they had an seo company working for them and then they went to another seo company and then they came to me so it was seven months after they'd had their website redone and a certain section of their website had lost about 50 percent of their traffic and when I went in to investigate, like, what was going on, it turns out that even though they put the redirects into the site to kind of tell, these are the things that tell Google, instead of going here, you now go here, um, they weren't actually working. So nobody had, they, they, they hadn't done them properly. And so no one had actually checked. There was no checking system, obviously, to check when the site went live, is this actually working? And so... So, so I think it's it's not just um, web developers, it's kind of, there needs to be like a system <laughs> so that people know, you know, these are the checks, these are the things that you have to do before the site gets done and then, and then when it goes live as well, just to make sure that it's actually working. So I've got a question for you to think about. Um, like, do you know where your website traffic is coming from? So if you think about your website, do you think it's coming from Google, from ads, social media, email marketing, from networking? And, and then the second question is, was that just a guess or do you absolutely know? And, and do you know how to even find this information? Did you even know it's possible <laughs> you know, to find this information? Because it only takes me five minutes to find out where your traffic's coming from. And so what I wanna to offer to people is before their new website goes live, a free five minutes <laughs> just to know what their risk is and to be able to make an informed decision. And I wanna give you a couple of case studies on that just so that you can see how for some people, 
that five minutes will show that they don't need to do anything. And then for other people, how critical it is um, for them. So the first study is Sarah. So I do a five minute check for her and find out that like 5% of her traffic is actually coming from Google. Now she makes $5,000 a month from her website leads. So if she loses 30% of her traffic, um, then she may lose $75 a month. So for her, she's not going to really need to pay, you know, $3,000 to $5,000 to get her SEO migrated. For her, more than likely, there'll be two pages on her website that probably gets traffic. And it would take me five minutes to just send an email back to her and go, look, you need to send this through to your web developer for the home page and this particular page here. They need to make sure they keep this SEO title and they need to keep that domain the same. And then it might be something like, and they need to make sure that they keep Brisbane in the footer of the website on your address. And that's my, that might be all it is that she needs to make sure that she you know, just keeps her 5% of traffic that she has. But then you've got someone like Michael, who's a deck builder. And when I do my five minute check, I find out that 80% of his traffic comes from Google. And he makes $100,000 a month from his website leads. So if he loses 30% of his traffic, he's losing $24,000 a month, which means he's gonna to have to put some staff off. He's gonna to have to make changes in his business. And so for him, getting me to come in and you know where it might be $3,000 or $5,000 as a one-off fee, just to make sure, which also includes monitoring for the next, you know, three to six months, just to make sure that his SEO is all transferred across. Because for someone like him, it can take anywhere from like 15 to 40 hours to make sure that his SEO gets transferred across properly. So you can see just like the massive difference between the first person and the second person. <laughs> and this is why I believe that it happens to the second person because I think that probably 95% of people are actually the first person. And so a lot of web developers, even SEOs, even aren't aware of this 5% of people like Michael, <laughs> where it's absolutely critical. And so I hear so often the people like Michael will come to me and say, oh, but the web developer said, or the SEO, they said it would be all right. They said they knew what they were doing and they said I'd keep all my traffic. And that happens every time. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, unless you're somebody who has been working like I do specifically with these kind of people where, where they're completely reliant on Google, um, then it can be difficult for people to understand that these kind of people exist, I think, <laughs> that, that are so reliant on Google because, um, you know, most of my clients will get 80, 90% of their traffic from Google. And so, so yeah, so that's what I'm very passionate about, trying to make that not, make sure that doesn't happen. <laughs> uh, so my ideal SEO referral is anyone who's getting a new website. I don't care if 95% of them come to me and I do a five minute check and I tell them that they don't need to do anything. <laughs> that's fine because it's, it's the 5% where they do that I really wanna make sure that, um, that they know what their risk actually is. And then when it comes to the kind of disaster, fun disaster kind of thing context, I'm looking for anyone with cryptocurrency knowledge, investing knowledge, setting up funds, and anyone who I haven't thought of before or that you might, everyone I haven't thought of that you might know that, that you think, oh, you know, that might be useful. So large hope, large hope SEO, and these are my contact details. Beautiful, Georgie. Thank you. Amazing. That was amazing. Absolutely fantastic, Georgie. I, I was moved to tears there. <laughs> yeah, it was a beautiful story. Um, thank you for sharing um, the, the, the background context as well. Um, you know, it helps us to um, get on board with, with where you're at and, and um, your mission as well.